But I do want to welcome you in today, and I want to let you know that, man, we had an amazing Easter last week. Can we give it up for our team and just for the experience? It was amazing. It was one of those moments where I really felt like, man, we are going the right direction. We're back, and we're excited. We had uh, close to 350 people that gathered with us in person last week. We got to share the Jesus story and the resurrection story with 92 kids, and we got to see eight people baptized in the name of Jesus. And so can we just celebrate that right now? And I hope that you are excited to be here because I want you to know that if you're in this room right now, that you're a part of something uh, very special, I believe. If you don't know our story, we are New Day Church. We are a replant. We're a new church for a new day. And we officially launched on September 15th of 2019, literally six months before the first big shutdown where everything went online. And so we were only functioning back in the normal former reality for about six months before everything changed. And so we were going and we were excited, but then as you know, everything just seemed to go crazy in the world and a lot of fear and a lot of problems and a pandemic that, Lord willing, we're coming out of, but we're still in. And so a lot happened. And so now uh, with the vaccine and just with the blessings that we have, it looks like we're going to come out of this. And so in a lot of ways, we are really just getting this thing started. And so if you are here, you are here from the very beginning, and it is our passion and it is our heart to create a church where everybody can find their new day in the name of Jesus. We want to create a church where every time someone steps foot on our campus or gets around some of us wherever we're at, that they get this weird sense that their life is about to change. We don't just trust Jesus so we can go to heaven when we die. We trust Jesus because we know he wants to do a new work in our lives. We have hope for the hurting and for the broken and for the lost. And this is an amazing moment where we can truly be the light of the world with everything that is going on around us. And we want to build here at this place a counterculture in the name of Jesus. People need to see a new way to do life. And we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we want to be that kind of church. And so if you're here, just by your presence of being here, you are helping us build this thing. And what we always say, listen, we like this, so we know that our friends and our family and others around us will like it as well. And if it blesses me, I know it's going to bless somebody else. And so we want everybody to get in on this. But we, and like every other church, probably in the world, we are rebuilding because this has been a, a crazy season of chaos. And I'm pretty sure the emotions and feelings are gonna catch up with me eventually, but right now I'm still high, okay? And I don't know about you, but like I know we've been through a lot, but like, listen, like this has been a crazy moment. And so now we are rebuilding and we see this season leading up to the fall really as a time to gain momentum and really begin building something that will make a big difference in the coming years. We want to see a, a church that meets all across our city. And somehow, in God's providence, it's been the best of times, worst of times. It's been a crazy moment, but we've been so blessed as a, as a church. We have a second campus coming. and a, Who knows? It's crazy, you know? But that's where we're at. Because God does things like that. And so because of that, we've been studying the book of Nehemiah. If you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. No judgment if you got to look in the table of contents at all. I'm a pastor. I still look at the table of contents at the beginning. <laughs> no judgment. And we're going through this book because um, the book of Nehemiah is about spiritual renewal. It's a firsthand look at how someone like Nehemiah leads a great renewal effort in his day. If you haven't been with us, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, Jerusalem was supposed to be this special city of God's people with a temple where the people would come and worship. And yet there was the wall that was broken down. And this is the ancient world, and so if you don't have a wall defending you, you will be destroyed and you will be conquered. And so if this wall does not get rebuilt around the city, then uh, God's people will be scattered again. The rebuilding effort will not happen, and it will be bad for the people spiritually because they're supposed to be this, this bright city in the world, a city on a hill. But all of God's people are scattered, and, and Nehemiah, one of God's people, is working for a foreign king, the king of Persia. 
And he gets a report that the wall is broken down and he is devastated because he was hopeful that God's people were rebuilding and yet when he finds out the wall is broken down, what that's telling him is it's not going well and things are in trouble. He believes in the glory and the goodness of God and, and yet this does not represent that. He wants to see God's people gathered and God be glorified because these people reflect God in the world. And so this issue reflects a problem and it reflects a lack of glory that his God is going to get. And so Nehemiah is broken and he lays before the Lord in prayer. And I love this. Nehemiah is, is frustrated and he's broken and he's sad, but he does something about it. Amen? He gets up and he does something. He says, he says I'll go do the, the work. I'll go rebuild. And so not only does Nehemiah ask God to give him favor to go rebuild, but that he would actually be the one to be able to lead the effort. And we saw in Nehemiah chapter 2 that Nehemiah was a man of character. He worked well for the king that he served, and because of that, the king trusted him, and because of that, he allowed him to go and rebuild the wall. And so Nehemiah, Nehemiah heads back to rebuild the wall, and we see in chapter 3, Pastor James preached a great sermon a few weeks back about how teamwork makes the dream work. Can I get an amen, right? You need a team. And we saw this beautiful moment where all of God's people come together and everybody has a part and everybody is contributing. Man, that's the kind of culture that we want to create here. Can I say this? If you're here and you're part of New Day, you matter a lot. We need you. <laughs> this is not a church yet where we've got enough people to where we don't need you. It's all hands on deck right now. It is all hands on deck. You want to serve? I got 10 places to choose from, okay? <laughs> you matter a lot. And when we come together to work, we can create something amazing. And then two Sundays ago, my really good friend Sergio Garcia uh, from the north side here in Houston came and preached a great message on the opposition as they began to rebuild and actually do a good work. They began to receive opposition from the outside. People were coming against them. People in their culture were coming against them. And he talked about how, listen, when you follow Jesus, things will come against you. People will come against you. There will be challenges but he encouraged us to press on like Nehemiah did. And yet what's interesting is that we go from uh, Nehemiah 4, where there's problems from the outside, to Nehemiah chapter 5, which is where we're going to be. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 5, and what we see here is actually problems on the inside. There's problems on the inside amongst the people of God, problems of uh, disunity and injustice and people taking advantage of each other. We see these problems coming from the inside. And he calls the people to reflect God in this world by being a people of both justice and unity to one another. And so I want to preach to you a message today, if you're taking notes, called a people of justice and unity. And I know you know this, there's a lot of talk in the world right now of, of justice and division. And man, we just live in a tribalized, polarized culture it's like everybody gets put into a group, into a tribe, if you will, and then we got to go fight the other tribes, you know, and, and it's just like, no matter, oh, oh, you're this, this, and this, okay, that means you're in this group, and you don't like these people, and there's just all this division in the world. And there's a lot of talk in the world about, um, about justice, and by talk, I mean arguing and fighting, that's what I mean. <laughs> not a lot of conversation, not a lot of prayerful discernment, just a lot of people arguing and fighting with one another. And yet what's interesting about Nehemiah chapter 5 is to preach this in the context of what it really means, because that's my job. My job isn't to get up here and say what I want to say or what you want me to say, but what the text says. This is actually about the people of God loving each other, serving each other, and about God's people being a place of justice and unity. I've reminded myself a lot in this season and other people that I'm a pastor, I'm not a politician. And so though I care about the world and though I want good for all people, the, the reality is, is that it is my job, my calling to be a pastor over a people of God, that I love you, and that what we want to do here is we want to build a place where we can reflect to the world what it should look like, right? The world is broken and, and the world wants answers, and we as the people of God can be a place that demonstrates what it's supposed to look like. And how we really walk together and help each other. So often the world is not a place of justice, but the church can be a place 
of justice. So often the world is not a place of unity, but we can be a place of unity. And as the church, as crazy as things are, this enables our light to shine even brighter, church. This is our moment. This is our time. It's not hard to, to convince people the world is broken right now, right? When I was growing up, it was like a time of like tolerance and it was like, you know, like, oh, just do your thing, I'll do my thing and who cares? And it was like, you had to wake people up to the reality of right and wrong. But it's not like that anymore. People know there's right and wrong. But the question is, is, is how do we actually live out a life of love? And the answer is Jesus Christ. In Christ, we can do this. And especially as the people of God, we cannot allow the world to divide us. We must keep division out of the church. We must love each other, and we must be the light of the world. And so I want to preach a message today called a people of justice and unity. And I want to answer the question, how do we live as a people of justice and unity in a broken world and culture? And Nehemiah 5 shows us this today. So I'm going to read Nehemiah 5 verses uh, 1 through 14, and I want to invite you to stand up with me at this time as we stand in the honor of the reading of God's word. As always, if you don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screen behind me. In my 5, starting in verse 1, it says, Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters, we are many. So let us grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our field and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. I took counsel with myself, Nehemiah says, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. And I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you were doing is not good. Ought you not walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations of our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen, and praise the Lord. And they did, and the people did as they promised. May God bless the reading of his word. You can be seated. I love this example that Nehemiah gives us as the people of God of how we can shine in this world as a people of, of justice, as a people of generosity, as a people of love and service for one another. And I want to pull out a few very important things, specifically talking, I believe, within the context of the church community, how we can be this kind of place based on the example of Nehemiah. How can we be a people of justice and how can we be a people of unity in the church? How can we care for each other even in the midst of our differences? I think Nehemiah shows us in verse 6. He says, I was very angry when I, hear this word, heard their outcry. And these words, the first thing we can do is this, is to listen with great empathy. I learned the power of this when I got married. I uh, married my wife, and uh, I remember being about a month into our marriage, I'm like, we are really different. 
Anybody have that experience in marriage? Like, you're like, wow. Oh, no one, y'all, y'all are different in marriage? You're just like, okay, whatever, yeah. Wake up, okay. I'm like, I'll, I'll, be the, I'll be the honest. You can't lie in church. Come on now, right? Like, be honest, you know. But we're, like, so different, you know. And uh, it's funny. I remember there was a season where we were trying to, like, trying to, we were doing a lot of talking and not a lot of listening and trying to tell each other what we needed. And they say in marriage, I saw a study once or something where they said, like, statistically, it's like the first seven years of marriage uh, you spend trying to make the person the person that you want them to be. I'm sure this includes dating too, right? So you're like, hey, I know you are who you are, but I'm going to make you who I need you to be, and I'm going to be able to make that happen, right? That's kind of the plan, right? And they say that years 7 to 14 tend to be happier years because you learn to just kind of embrace your spouse for who they are, not like in bad or sinful ways or things like that, right? But just in like their personality that they're different than you. Like, Halsey is the sweetest thing in the world. She, I call her sunshine personified, you know. And I would like to think I'm a nice guy, but I am not sunshine personified. That is not who I am, right? We are different, right? And the reality is, is that whenever you come into the church, you're going to come across people that are very different. And what I've always thought is really cool about Christianity, and I mean this, right? Like, I think Christianity might be the, the one place where, where truly diverse people really do all serve the same God. A lot of religions, even a lot of like nations tend to be specific often to a kind of group of people, right? Maybe there's like a majority and then there's other minorities, but like really Christianity is a truly global thing. I remember when I was in, I went to Walter High School and uh, we had this, this Christian student union and uh, we would go on like it's like Tuesday mornings or something. And I remember when I showed up there, I mean, it was an amazing experience because, like, you know, Walter High School had, like, 1,800 students. And I showed up to the Christian Student Union so you can see, like, the, the spiritual strength of our school. And we had, like, 13 people there, like, 1,800 kids. like 13 of us rolling in, right? Um, but we rolled in. But the coolest thing about it was we were all so different, right? Like, the, the whole school was so divided in different ways. You typically hung out with people like you. But the Christian, I remember there was this one guy. He was, like, from Brazil, this really long, cool, like, curly black hair. He's like a soccer player from, like, Brazil. There was, like, this, like, you know, this Hispanic girl, and she was, like, like the, the valedictorian of her class, you know. There was this, like, you know, other guy who was, like, a bookworm type of person. But we were just this really diverse group of people with, like, nothing in common except Jesus. But here's what I want to tell you. That was more than enough. We had amazing relationships. We, we walked together. We encouraged each other. And it was one of the most diverse experiences I've ever had in my entire life. And yet it was only possible in the name of Jesus. And what's happening in Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, I want to explain this for you. There's an outcry. We see in verse 1, there arose a great outcry. And let me explain what's happening. So all of God's people have come back together. And they're all working hard together to rebuild the temple. Once again, we all matter. We all have a role to play. So they're working together to rebuild the temple. Yet yeah, there's a problem because the people that are of poorer or lesser means in the community, because they're so focused on rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, they're not able to work as much. So they can't pay their bills. They can't get food to the point where, where even literally some of them are having to put their kids into what's called like slave debt where you would basically be someone's slave for a while to pay back a debt that you owed somebody. And so if you had more money or if you had more means, right, then you could be okay with focusing on rebuilding the wall, maybe losing a little bit of money because you had a cushion, but for those of lesser means or like paycheck to paycheck, they're like, we're hurting here. Yet the great problem that happens is in the midst of this problem, those who do have more means and more money, they, they begin, uh, quote unquote, helping those of lesser means, but by lending them money to pay off their debts, but with interest. Or they would say, okay, I'll pay this for you, but give me some of your land and you can buy it back for me one day. But what they're saying here is, but we can't ever get ahead. And so I can't ever get my land back. And so really it's just been a scheme for me to give up my, my land. And so in a moment when maybe those in the community who had more of the means could have shown compassion and care, they're actually taking advantage of them. And yet I love what Nehemiah does in verse 6. It says that he hears their outcries. And, and the reason why this is so important is because Nehemiah was not like them. Nehemiah was more well off. Nehemiah had more money. He was a respected person. He came from the king's court. He was of a higher socioeconomic class, and yet Nehemiah was not one of the people who was charging interest for people. Nehemiah was helping people out. 
And so I say that because Nehemiah didn't really relate on that level with them, but he took time to listen to them with empathy, and he began to legitimately feel their pain and to care for them. Any uh, grill people out here, people like to grill? Summer's coming, where my grill master's at, okay? Yeah, we got a lot of grillers, you know. Invite me over, I want to come over, right? I'm not a grill master, but I do know how to grill a little bit. I actually got a new grill coming for the summer. I've been keeping it in my garage, keeping it all nice. I'm about to roll that bad boy out. Grill me some stuff pretty quick. And uh, I'm, by, I'm by no means a grill master, but I, I got two, two go-tos that I can do. I can do two things. I can't grill a lot, but you want a hot dog or you want some grilled chicken, I got you, okay? And my family loves when I make hot dogs because whenever I make hot dogs, or, or I like making hot dogs because, like, if you grill hot dogs, it's, like, super easy, right? Like, I throw it on the grill and, like, seven minutes, they're done, delicious, and the bun's already made. And so my family is like, oh, it's amazing, and it's so easy to make, right? But my favorite thing to make is actually grilled chicken, right? And I love to marinate it because for so long I would make grilled chicken and it wouldn't taste very good. It tasted nasty, right? It tasted tough, you know? And true story, I just didn't grow up grilling or cooking or anything, so I didn't know you have to like marinate the meat, right? Like the separation is in the preparation, okay? That's where it's at, right? But it's different, right? Because whenever you marinate something, this is where I'm really bad, like you've gotta like plan it out, right? So if I'm gonna eat food at like six o'clock, right, I gotta start marinating it at like four o'clock. But you marinate it, right? And when you marinate, you let the juices seep in. It's a, it's a process, and it takes time, and it takes preparation. And when you try to understand somebody different than you, there, there's, a, there's a marination process that has to happen. When I talk to someone that has some of my background or where I'm from or in, in my socioeconomic class or whatever it is, I relate a lot more. I can hear them talk, and I kind of get it, Right? But in the church, when you get around people that are different from you or different backgrounds, maybe they were raised and their family was of this political party or your family was of this political party or whatever that background is, it takes time to understand somebody. It's not an overnight process. And when you look out in the world, you know what you see? You see a lot of people talking at each other. You don't see a lot of listening or attempting to understand one another. Hear this verse in Proverb 18, verse 2. I think we all need this. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. You see, when we talk about listening to other people, it doesn't mean that we have to affirm things that are wrong. It doesn't mean anything like that. Like, like listening is not about compromising any conviction that you might have. I think we're afraid if we listen that we're going to have to agree with somebody. But, but I'm just talking about listening here. James chapter 1 says it this way. Let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. <laughs> and isn't social media the opposite of that, right? Slow to listen, fast to speak, fast to anger. But church, may we be different. See, Jesus is God, wasn't like us, but he came into the world, took on flesh, came into the world, bore our sins. He walked among us. He, he felt our pain. He lived on this earth for a total of literally 33 years. He marinated in the human experience in its fullness. And Jesus came into the world to love us and to know us and ultimately to save us. And so the most important thing I think that we can do to be a people of, of unity and to help people in need and to understand where they're coming from is we have to commit to, listen, if you're different than me, I'm going to take time to listen to you. I want to know. I want to understand. And I know that I don't know. And this goes for all of us. We move on to Nehemiah chapter 5, starting in verse 7. Nehemiah says, I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. And I said to them, you are exacting interest each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we as far as we are able have bought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers who have been sold to the nations that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of, our nation, of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. 
Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you, may be, that you are exacting from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they promised. I, also, I love this part. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. And I love this moment because Nehemiah steps in and, and, and begins to address the issues within the people of God. He addresses the disunity within the people of God. And he just simply does this. He does the work of justice. He's mindful of it. So we listen with great empathy, but we also do the work of justice, Nehemiah is, is angry because people are taking advantage of other kinds of people. And yet what I love here, I think this is important for us to note, right, just a good reminder, that like the reason why Nehemiah is so frustrated is because he's like, listen, guys, like we've, we've brought back our people out of the world because the world is corrupt and the world is broken. And yet even when we come to gather the people of God, the same things are happening, it defeats the purpose to come out of the world and into the people of God to just do the same things. And so for us as followers of Jesus, what we need to realize is that whenever you follow Jesus, like your life changes. That we follow Jesus, that our life, even in the here and now, would change. And I also love this moment because um, though it is important to work towards justice in the world, the, the reality is, is that the world is broken. And here's the problem. Like, I... I feel like it's like we, we keep telling people that like, you know, that all of us as humans, we're just like partially evolved forms of, of matter that are, it's meaningless in this universe. At least when I was coming up, it was like, well, there really is no right or wrong. There's kind of what you think and what I think. There's not really a, a God and there's not really a clear set of right or wrong, you know? So there's like not right, there's not wrong, no one's clear on that. And there's no real purpose behind our, our, our lives, no meaning. You know, we just kind of came out of nowhere for no reason. And then we think out of that culture that we're going to create a place of justice and care for all people. See, the world is so broken, the, the world is so divided because what they so often don't understand is that worldviews have consequences. And even for me, when I was going through my, like, like growing up and really thinking about my faith and making it my own, am I really going to be a Christian or am I just going to be more secular? Like, this was one of the things for me that really always drove me back to Jesus. Any moment when I was ever tempted to wander because I was like, okay, listen, if I were to walk away from Jesus and believe something else, I'm going to live a coherent life. So if I'm going to believe secular things, I'm, I'm, I'm going to live a secular life and I'm not going to just like pretend like there's right and wrong if you tell me there's no right and wrong. And I'm okay with loving people and serving people, but, but I want a worldview that, that supports that. And so often what we don't realize, even in the good ways in our world where we want justice for all people or we want all people to be cared for, what, what most people don't realize is that comes from a Christian foundation. Not all the founding fathers were Christian, I know that. But there was a clear allowance of Christianity to shape America in the beginning. And when you look at a lot of nations and a lot of cultures, it is not just expected that we care for people when they're hurting. That that's because we have a Christian, like, uh, inheritance in so many ways. And what we tried to do is maybe get rid of God but kind of keep some of the values. But what we see is it's broken. But here's the reality. In the church, we know everybody is created in the image of God. It's not hard for us to love people and to serve people. That's not a hard thing to do. It makes sense with our worldview. And so we want to do the work of justice because our God is just. And we want to be people in the community where we're, we're contributing and not just using people in the church. And so there's a lot of ways that we can do this in the church. I think one of the great examples is just to be very mindful of people that are different than us. I love how patient, like, Nehemiah is. I mean, these people come. It's like an outcry, it says. They didn't come with the right words. They didn't say it the right way. They might have misspoke or something. And yet Nehemiah listens. He, he's like, okay, listen, I love you, and you're hurting. You're in pain. You're frustrated. Like, I care. And so in this moment, Nehemiah leans in, and I love it. I mean, he, he makes it right. <laughs> he's like, man, give them their land back. Quit, and, quit doing interest. Love your brothers and your sisters. 
And so as a church and as a community, may, may we be a place that loves everybody. And I want to honor you, New Day, because, listen, I know it's been a crazy season, but I think in a lot of ways, like, I mean, I think you guys have been very, very faithful and very patient through all this chaos. You guys are reasonable people, and I see you week in and week out being so generous to so many different kinds of people. And we don't publicize this a lot because, you know, listen, if you have a need and you come to us, we're not going to, like, you know, usually put you on social media or something, but, like, as a church community, like when we give together, when we contribute financially or any other way, I mean, we, in this church, man, we help people all of the time. We pay bills, we pay um, mortgages, and people, when people lose their job, there'll be moments they just get a check from the church, right? We just like send it out there. They don't even ask for it. We just know they're in hard times. When we hear that someone's hurting, when we hear that somebody is in need, I'm telling you, like we as a church are so generous to so many different people. And we know that when someone falls in hard times, we want to be there for them. One of the great blessings that we had recently was we opened up as a, a warming center during the historic winter storm. Because, you know, even like nature is in chaos right now in the world. And so we have like the worst flood we've ever had, and our hurricane just a few years back, and now the, the winter storm of 2021. And as a church, we realize, listen, we have a building, and we have heat, and we have plumbing, and so we have something. Other people don't. They're literally freezing, and so we opened up as a warming center, and over 30 different people literally came and sought refuge here. And we have people from the church, like, bringing food and bringing all kinds of stuff, and we were stocked up here. We were telling people, listen, they're like, well, I don't know if I can come. I don't have food. I don't have whatever. I don't have linens or whatever. Like, no, just come and we'll get you everything that you need. And we got so much of a blessing from our community. People were reaching out and they were just so inspired by a church opening up its doors to people in need. Another way that we want to be a church of, of justice is we love helping churches of maybe lesser means. And so there's churches that we partner with that are maybe in areas that are, it's harder financially to support a church. And we, as a church, when you give, we directly serve and give in this way. Another way that we can be a, a church of, that loves one another is that we all commit to serve together, right? That, that any given Sunday, man, we've got so many people that are serving and using their gifts and abilities Right now, our kids are learning about Jesus and not being bored by my sermon because we have people that are with them right now, and they're not able to be in here right now and worship with us because they're serving. And we want to make sure that burden doesn't fall too heavy on certain kinds of people because it can, because we don't require anything. But we want to do the work of justice. We want to do the work of loving people and helping people in their needs. And yet what I love about this story is it's not just about justice, but it even goes a wonderful step further. I'm going to finish with verses 14 through 19. I love this. Nehemiah says, moreover, from the time I was appointed to be their governor. So Nehemiah becomes the governor. He's given an official position in the land of Judah from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxes, the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them their daily ration, 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so. Why? Because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work on the wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now that was prepared at my expense for each day and was one ox and six choice sheep and birds and every 10 days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for this people. And I love this because what Nehemiah shows us is that we actually exceed justice and radical generosity. That should mark the people of God. But guys, justice is just a baseline. <laughs> justice is just fairness. That's just like being up to par. That's not even the ultimate standard. That we're called to radical generosity. Like what if we were always giving to one another all of the time? Just how, what can I do? How can I help? Like, what if when people walked in, like, man, they're always trying to help me. 
What if we, the church, could really be that kind of a community? The world doesn't operate that way. Everyone's afraid of losing their stuff in the world. I love how in verse 14 he says, moreover, meaning like exceedingly. There's justice, yes, but that's a baseline. And, and, and right here, there was this thing you see in the text called the governor's allowance. And so what that meant was that in this time, what the governor was allowed to do legally was raise taxes so that he could have more things and eat more food. It was an honor culture. And so if you, it was like, you know, if you're the governor, you should be rich and you should be taken care of. And yet he says that the former governors lorded it over the people and raised the taxes. And yet he says, when I became the governor, I did not do that. But instead, I opened up my table to 150 men. That the position that he gets, he stewards for the good of people of less means. And he tells us why. Because he fears God. See, in Nehemiah chapter 1, whenever you go back, what, what Nehemiah does whenever he wants to begin rebuilding the wall, he prays for success. He goes to God, he lays before the Lord and says, God, I know if you don't bless this effort, I know it's not going to work. He goes, I know everything comes from you, God. And so when he becomes the governor, he knows that it came from God. He knows that. He's aware of that. And so he know, but he knows that God has given him this position to steward it for the good of people. All of us in one way, shape, or form have some kind of an abundance in our life that we have been blessed with. And I don't want to diminish your hard work or my hard work. Listen, I, I know it's, it's hard and working jobs. I, I know that, but I'm always reminded that like even in the ways that I work hard, I didn't even choose to be alive. Right? Like, well, I worked hard with my brain and my hands and my body and my ability. And it's like, okay, but did you give yourself your brain, your hands, and your body? Like, that, it's a gift. Even the ability to work hard is a blessing that comes from God. And when we realize that everything ultimately comes from God and that he blesses us to be a blessing, we become a generous people. One of the stories that I am the most ashamed about as we draw to a close is um, when I was growing up, you know when you're growing up and you want to give your parents like a gift for their birthday or something, but you ain't got no money because you're nine or whatever, you know? Um, my mom took me, this is very embarrassing, but um, she took me to the store on her birthday to Target or something. Like, like K, Remember Kmart? bags like Kmart back in the day, you know? And um, she gave me some money on her birthday. And I was so self-focused that I was thinking, oh, she's giving me money. Oh, she's being real generous on her birthday, you know, to give, me, to give me something, you know. So it's her birthday, but she wants to give me something. I love my mom. She's so nice, you know. And so I go in there with the money that she gave me, and I go into Kmart, and I bought myself like a remote control race car. And I thought it was so cool. And afterwards, we're coming back home, and I can tell my mom is not pleased with what I just did. And I was like, Mom, what, what's wrong or whatever? She's like, I don't know, John. I just thought that maybe you would buy me something on, on my birthday. And I hadn't even, I, I felt so bad. I did not even realize it. It wasn't like I was trying to, I just didn't even see it until I did. And I think so often in life, we don't even see it. We don't wake up every day realizing that like God woke you up, that even any ability you have, it all comes from God. It's all from Him. And as a church, when, when we live that way, what we realize is that God doesn't give to us, God gives through us. That everything you have, every abundance that you have, somebody else could, could use. And what if we change the way of seeing everything that we have? It's a gift from God and it's given to us, just like my mom gave me money, but to, but to give it back to her so that I show that I know where it comes from. And I'm by no means a prosperity preacher, but I do believe that God loves to bless steward because that's why we're blessed to be a blessing ultimately 
And this is the gospel. Because what the Bible says is that Jesus came into the world. What we celebrate at Christmas is how God in Christ took on a body and came into the world. That, that he literally took up a body, but ultimately, why? To lay it down for us on the cross and to forgive us. He took it up to lay it down. And listen, I, I, the reality is, is all of our possessions and all of those things that we have, listen, we can't take any of that with us. I know we can save it up and give it to our kids, but here's the problem. They can't take it with them either. Then what if the church could really become the most radically generous place in the world? What if we could become that kind of people? By God's grace, I pray that we are becoming that kind of people. And I love how he invites 150 people to come sit at his table. My question to you today is who needs to be sitting at your table? Because we make money, or we, we, we get possessions, or we get a nice house. And listen, if we don't bless people, it feels so empty, doesn't it? It's like you're at this massive table that God's given you. It's just like you and one other person eating there. But what if we were inviting people to the table and saying, sit and eat, and, and what lack do you have, and, and how can I make a difference, and how can I be a blessing? Because what the gospel of Jesus is supposed to do is it's supposed to impact all of your life. It's not just about going to heaven when we die. It's about living out the gospel, the, the sacrifice of Jesus in everything, in our marriages. Listen, like, in your marriage, this is how you have a good marriage. You listen with great empathy. You try to understand. This is how you bring about racial reconciliation as you, as you listen. It's like, I want to understand. This is how when someone wrongs you in the church and you're at odds with them, it's like, man, I, I want to understand so that I can do what I can. Because I don't want to let the world divide us and I don't want to let my sin divide us. Because we got to get together because we're supposed to be the light of the world. We are one team on the same mission. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, God made him being Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Would you stand with us at this time? I love the song, Jesus Paid It All. It says that he paid our debt of sin, that we had a debt that we could not pay. And yet he came into the world and he forgave us. And yet here's the good news, church. This changes all of our life. How we serve, how we interact in the church, how we interact in the world, this changes everything. We had an incredible moment last week where we had a, a baptism service. I saw this really cool thing. We had uh, this one kid came forward. His name was Antonio. I think he's here today in, in kids' church. And he came forward. He wasn't even planning to get baptized. But we did a call. I said, listen, if you need to get baptized today, you, you come forward. Let's just do this right now. Like God's calling someone's name right now. And we had this picture of him right here. This is his baptism. I love baptism pictures. I love like the coolest thing ever. His, he has his raised to life sharp. I mean, this is like the perfect picture. In the moment, man, giving his life to Jesus and embracing it. But what's so cool is this, as cool as that is, as cool as that is, his mom posted a picture a couple of days later. Here's the next picture. This is Antonio going back to school on Tuesday. And he told him, I said, mom, I, you gotta wash my baptism shirt because I wanna wear it to school. And he wore it to school. I was like, oh, that's it, oh, that's it. It's not just a one time, it's all of your life. It's not just like a thing at church, but I'm gonna to go to school. I'm raised to life and my school needs to know that as well. It impacts all of your life. And in the same way, the gospel of Jesus impacts everything that we do, how we love each other, how we give generously, how we bear with one another, even in difficult moments. It impacts everything. 